Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Lori Rubin and I'm here with Mac Fun Software. I've got the wonderfully talented Alan Hess here today with us today and he is going to be talking about pet photography. Now if you don't know who Alan Hess is, and I know probably 99% of you do, but he's a San Diego based photographer and he specializes in concert and live event photography, but he does a ton of other things. He's, I was just talking to him and I, Alan, I was saying that you're probably the most versatile photographer I know right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Thank you. Yeah. So besides, you know, concerts and he's shooting hockey here in San Diego and, uh, you know, he does his pet photography, he does all these other venues and it's just incredible. I think we were at a Lipizzan Stallion um, event a few years back that he was just photographing as well. So uh, he's just very talented. He writes many books. In fact, uh, I'd like him to talk to you about a new uh, his pet photography book that he came out with as well. So he's going to be talking all about pet photography and uh, just sit back and relax. And Alan, thank you so much for joining us. One last thing I do want to say is he'll be talking a little bit about Mac Fun. And for those of you who don't have any of our products, you can save 10% off any of the Mac Fun Pro products by using his promo code, which is Alan Hess. First name, last name, Alan Hess. Okay, Alan, thanks again. And uh, everybody enjoy. Right. This is going to be great. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, it's uh, 5 o'clock here in San Diego. and um, to another beautiful day. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about pet photography, how I got started in it, um, why I do it, and uh, then I'm going to I'll transition into some tips on uh, things I've learned uh, about how to get the best out of your pet um, and your pet photography. I'll also touch a little bit on my post-processing, um, especially using Intensify and Tonality from the MacFun software line. So, oh, I jumped ahead. So it all started um, with Odessa. Uh, Odessa, um, she's, she passed away late last year, but we adopted her uh, 10 years ago. This is the very first photo I ever took of her when she uh, came to our house. You could see she was a little underweight and um, looked a little trepidatious, but she uh, definitely uh, changed my life. Um, we rescued her from the local Humane Society, and we thought it would be really fun to, to have a dog, and um, we were right. And it turned out she was a constant companion of mine in my office, and um, basically I would set up photo shoots to practice things, to try out lighting, and she became one of my main models. Uh, after a while, we, we got her a companion. Um, that, that was Hobbs. So Hobbs is a little one with a giant ears flapping in the wind there, and um, this was one of the first days that they actually met and were playing in the backyard, and they got along um, really, really well. Sometimes they got along um, and uh, decided to play in the house. So this was the couch in the in the living room, and um, between Hobbs and Odessa, um, they actually destroyed it. Uh, and um, later on. Uh, so I started doing um, a little more uh, kind of posed portraits with uh, these two, and um, this led uh, to having a lot more fun photographing my dogs. So I was doing uh, things, this is uh, based on the invisible black background trick you can do in photography, and I just basically did it right in the living room, and um, my wife is standing out of the camera with a, a, a cookie in each hand, and she's got the dog's absolute attention. So this became kind of like where I went. Uh, this is became where I went to when I wanted to just uh, photograph something for fun. I was busy working at the San Diego Sports Arena, and um, I was busy writing books. And in the in the meantime, I kind of wanted to just do something just for me. So I ended up taking a lot of pictures of my dogs. Then I started stalking my neighbor's cat. So this is Snowball. She lives next door and she used to hang out and the dogs used to go crazy so and then the neighbors found me crawling around their yard trying to get decent shots of their cats uh, it's not that tough um, snowball was a was an, an absolute ham and would uh, play for the camera and uh, the neighbors just thought I was completely crazy because I'm lying out on the back porch trying to take photographs we started taking um, Odessa and Hobbs, they started meeting friends. So this this was Hallie. This was a friend of ours, little puppy they got. We took uh, Odessa and Hobbs over, and the next thing you know is I'm lying on the floor with a dog, and I'm taking photographs um, for friends because they were like, oh, my God, we need to get pictures of our dog. And I was just there, and I enjoyed it. This was not done for a business. It was not done um, to promote anything. It was just done for me. It was all done because I just wanted to have something that I would enjoy doing um, as opposed to working with my camera. So it led to two books. 
um, I was writing for Peach Pit, and we did a, a fuel book, which is a ebook. Um, it's called Pet Portraits That Stand Out. It's just basically the black background um, uh, portrait concept and how to set it up, how to get your dog or cat to, to kind of pose in the right place. And um, it, it's available on Amazon. It's available from fuelbooks.com and it's from Peach Pit. I think it's $5.99 or $6, something like that. It's just a, a nice 80 page ebook. Um, and it's just that run real quick trick on how to do the portraits. What that led to is uh, my editors at Peach Pit coming to me and going, well, why don't we do a whole full book on pet photography? And we'll put it in the uh, snapshots to gray shots line and, and we'll, you know, you can kind of grow on it. And I, I thought, man, that would that'd be fantastic. So um, because Odessa was on the cover of the ebook, I put Hobbs on the cover of the print book. Um, you got to play fair when it comes to your kids. So. Uh, just on a side note, uh, Hobbs is named, uh, actually Lori, who was running this webinar, was the one who came up with Hobbs' name. Uh, she was over at the house. She saw Hobbs like two days after we got him, and she has a dog named Calvin, and she was like, oh, that looks like a great friend for my dog Calvin. And our brains just went, oh, my God, we should call him Hobbs. And it turns out it's been the perfect name for him ever since because he is crazy. But anyway, so the, the tips I'm going to get into um, are basically uh, from the pet photography from Snapshots to Great Shots book. I, I've rewritten them for this. I've added some new pictures. I've used some old ones. Um, none of them are especially uh, secretive, but um, you'll see how they all kind of work together to get the best shot possible. So the first one is you got to get down and shoot at eye level. Um, I have old knees, uh, and so I don't always like to get down especially on the ground, especially carrying a camera, but I tend to find out that it's a whole lot better than standing above your pet and photographing straight down. So this is what most people start out as, and you're looking straight down. This is Gigi. She lives next door. She's a very cute dog, but she looks a whole lot better when you get her down on her level. Um, there's, you become part of their world. So when I'm when I'm photographing, I usually try to stay a little bit far away, and I usually try to get down on the ground before I'm approaching the animal. Uh, here's Hobbs. As you can see, he likes to, to dig in the dirt, and he likes to get down. I was sitting across the yard from him. I want to be in his world. I want to see what it's like from that angle. This is Underdog, or at least uh, it's dressed up as Underdog. This was done at a, at a pet walk that they do to raise uh, money for canine cancer, and um, I just positioned myself down sitting in front of a bench, and as the dogs and people were coming towards me, I was shooting at the dogs eye height. And I get a much more intimate feeling of the pet from that angle instead of just standing up and shooting down at them as they're looking up. Uh, we are really lucky down here in San Diego. We have Dog Beach. Dog Beach is one of the best places uh, down in Ocean Beach. Um, you get dogs off leash. You get a lot of action. Um, of course, I am sitting with my butt in the sand and um, this dog just walked up and started digging a hole right in front of me, so it was a kind of a perfect position to be in. Uh, it doesn't it works well for cats as well. Uh, I was lying in the neighbor's yard. Um, it's a different neighbor. It's a different cat. This is my friend Celeste's cat, and the cat was a little bit hesitant about what I was doing there, but being low and lying in the ground, I managed to get this great angle straight across the grass right at the cat's face. Now, I had to wait there quite a while, um, for the cat to finally look at me, but it's definitely worth it. Sometimes the animals are sitting in a chair, which is a little easier for me. Um, this cat is quite grumpy. It's, it's not the grumpy cat, but definitely not that pleased that I was sitting there photographing it. Uh, it was this again, I was just sitting on the, on the floor in front of the chair and um, waiting for the cat to give me a good expression. You need a lot of action. Um, down on that level. It's a little more uh, dangerous when the animals are running towards you, so a lot of times I try to angle myself where I'm not going to get run over. Uh, I was photographing a horse and I didn't realize it, but the horse's friend came over um, and came up and blindsided me, so nowadays I tend to be very careful as to what's on the side of me when I'm photographing um, pets, especially those that are running uh, hard. But you get, the, you get a different view on the action when you're sitting down low. Um, they're they're not angry. They're just they're just plain. Um, you get a, you get quite a fun expression when you're photographing it about a two thousandth of a second. You get all the little uh, nuances. But again, everything that I'm doing, I'm trying to be as low right at the right at the same level as the as the pet I'm photographing. So the first thing is to stay 
right down at eye level. And that leads right into point two, that you want to focus right on the eyes. So um, I always keep the focus point as close as I can to the pet's eyeball. Um, it's the same as when it comes to photographing people. You want to make sure that the eye is in focus. If the eye is not in focus, the image is kind of ruined. So um, you have to kind of watch it with, it with a pet a little more than a person because the eye and the nose are um, long. So you can actually, uh, we'll get to it in a second, I'll show you some examples, but you can actually get the eye in focus and the nose will be out of focus if you use a shallow depth of field, which I do. So you want to keep the focus point just right on the eye. And um, as you can see, you know, a little puppy in the grass and the focus point is directly right on the eye. Um, because this puppy had kind of a smushy little face, the eye and the nose are both in, in great focus. Um, if I zoomed in really close in the eyeball, I could probably get my own reflection um, as I was photographing their first day out in the yard. So this cat was photographed right inside of a doorway um, and all the light is coming from the outside. Now what's really interesting about cats and their eyes is that this was a very bright afternoon. So you can see if you look at the cat's eyes that the iris is just a thin little slit. That's a cat that's looking into a bright light. Photographing a cat inside, I get the opposite thing. I actually get much more uh, pupils are open and I get more black and the color around it is different. As you can see here, this is kind of shot with a little bit of a soft box where the cat's eyes had adjusted um, and keeping the focus directly right on the eyeball. This is actually done a little later. Uh, you'll see a little hand holding a treat. This is how we got the cat to look up and down. We just moved the treat up and down. Um, but I'm keeping the focus directly on the eyeball. And even when I'm photographing uh, other pets, um, I hope no one out there really hates snakes because there's a couple more pictures of them coming up. But again, the focus point was directly on the eye. And as you can see, the depth of field drops off right behind the neck. So everything is, is tack sharp and you're drawn into it because of that focus point being directly on the eye. So depth of field is important. Um, it's important in all pictures for all reasons, but if you do it, if you use a shallow depth of field, as I really love to do, you get the um, animals pop right off the background. So I shoot between usually right around f2.8 to f4 most of the time. That actually is for most of my photography is I really love to live at the very, very wide apertures. All right, um, so as you can see from these little puppies playing in the yard, the focus point was on the first puppy right on their eyeball. Um, the depth of field is so shallow that by the third puppy um, right over here around this eyeball, it's, uh, this is dropped out of focus. This right here is in a sharp focus. So that's a, that shot at f2.8, you don't have a lot of space to play with. Um, as you can even see, the grass in front of them is in focus, but the, the trees right behind them are just gone. It's, it's, it makes the, the shot stand out. Again, focus was right on the eyeball of the bird. Even these feathers here are starting to fall out of focus because of the angle that I was shot at. So the head and the beak and the eye are all tack sharp and everything else is starting to fall, um, fall away. Sometimes I go a little deeper. I wanted to get the owner of the dog in with the dog in the picture. So um, this has probably gone out to about F4, F5, 6. Um, the background is still nicely uh, blurred, um, yet the dog is tack sharp and the owner is semi sharp. Same difference, uh, I wanted to make sure the whole animal was in focus so I switched from F2A uh, to F4 so that I could get from the nose all the way to the tail in focus and yet the water in the background is, is blurred. Um, the only problem with this is that I sometimes get a little stuff here on the side that's in the same plane as the animal comes in focus the seaweed, seaweed and stuff on the side. I mean, you can take it out in Photoshop, you can leave it, it's, it's you know, up to you. Um, but I'm still only at about F4 here. I'm still trying to make sure that I'm, I'm having the, the animal or the pet really pop off, off the background. So when I was photographing this beautiful horse uh, up on these people's property, um, this is the only time that I started actually going in a, in a F5, 6, um, F9. Uh, we had A, we had a lot of sunlight, so I, I had a lot of apertures that I could actually choose from. 
and B, I wanted some of this hills in the background to actually be more in focus to give it a sense of space. I definitely wanted the fence to come into focus. Um, so it was a matter of, of trying to set the whole scene at the, where the property is, where it is out in the hills. Um, this has actually been probably one of my favorite horses to photograph. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, one for the setting where it's in this corral is at the um, base of their house with the hills in the background. And two, it's just an absolutely beautiful animal. Um, you can use the uh, depth of field to kind of set the scene. This cat was stalking the, the little toy we were using. Um, and I managed to just get that focus point right on the eye past the green in the front. And there's that very, very narrow, very, very shallow depth of field right on the cat's head. So the grass in the front, um, this ivy here goes out of focus, and the grass in the back starts to drop out of focus. Yet yeah, the cat's ears are seen, and so is the eyeball. Uh, it's really, really key that this eye was in focus and that everything else um, kind of drifted out. So this is Odessa, and these were done as a, as a test to talk about the depth of field. In this picture right here, where the nose is in focus, the eye is out of focus. In this picture, the eye is in focus, and the nose is out of focus. These are both taken at f2.8. And because I was close enough and her head was a little long, we had um, two different focus areas. Uh, so, excuse me. <coughs> so in the end, I ended up going to F5.6 to make sure that the nose and the eyes are both in focus. Um, I still had her far enough away from, this is actually the door to my backyard, is right over here. And I still had her far enough away from that that it dropped into um, kind of a little bit of a blur and made her pop out. But because I was so close, I didn't want just the nose or the eye to be in focus. I wanted the whole face to be in focus. So sometimes you have to do that, especially when you've got a pet that has a longer face. Um, she's a boxer. She had a longer face. Some dogs even have longer faces. Um, so you got to kind of just watch that and be a little careful. All right. I'll hold on half a moment. Seem to be having a cough. All right, continuous autofocus is definitely the way to go. Um, the camera keeps focusing until you press the shutter release button all the way down. That helps me track the movement. I also uh, pick the number of focus, well, not fouls points, but focus points to use. I like a single focus point or, an, or using nine points. So um, I'm a Nikon shooter. The Nikon cameras have, a, have options to how many focus points the camera actually uses when they're, when they're taking photographs. I really like using a single focus point. I'll show that in a sec. So even when the subject is not moving or not moving very much, I use continuous autofocus. That's what my camera is uh, set to as a default. Um, even the little breathing and any movement they'll have, uh, I want to make sure that I'm capturing it. So this is Hallie. Hallie doesn't um, move a lot when she's sleeping, um, and she was just laying on the floor. So I lay down on the floor with her, and I got a shot. I had the focus point right on the eye. Um, continuous autofocus, one point. Uh, photographing a running horse, you definitely need continuous autofocus. Again, I was keeping the focus point right on the eye of the horse, um, right into this neck area here, as the horse was turning around the corner. Um, if this was a single point, the camera never would have been able to refocus in time. Uh, continuous autofocus keeps it tracking as the animal is moving around. Uh, this is Hobbs and his new friend Rex. Rex was, uh, we fostered Rex for a week. He stayed over at the house. They had a lot of fun playing in the yard. Um, they are very rambunctious dogs. There's another shot you'll see in, in a minute of Hobbs and Rex playing. Uh, Hobbs doesn't look too concerned that Rex is showing all those teeth because they're just barking and having a good time. But they're actually moving quite fast uh, through the yard. This, this is frozen, but it was a, a frozen spot. So I just sat down and had the autofocus point on Rex for this and just uh, tracked them as they moved and shot a sequence. A uh, couple of dogs playing on the beach um, in probably the, the harshest light possible. This was taken at about noon, but uh, it was just to show that you could actually, you know, just keep that autofocus right on the lead animal. Again, here the focus point was right on this dog, right on his face, right on the ball. And as they were running across, I was just snapping away, uh, making sure that that little part was in focus. The camera did the rest. Um, sometimes I like to show a little motion. This is the same thing. I'm actually keeping the focus point 
uh, right on the face of the dog. We happen to move up and down a little bit, so the little spots here are more focused. This was just taken at a lower shutter speed, and it was basically a panning shot. But the focus in the camera is keeping track with um, the head of the animal as, I, as, it, as it was running. So um, I'm going to keep the I'm going to control the focus point. I'm I'm really I don't let the camera I don't shoot on auto modes. I don't let the camera's focus pick the mode. I like to use one point and let the camera kind of keep that one point in line, and then I move the camera to match up with it. So here we got these two who are playing on the beach, and um, I'm going to overlay the grid of the focus points and the Nikon. Um, I think this was shooting with a D4. I made sure that focus point was right on um, the ball. Uh, it had just, I had just moved it down. It was originally up here on the eye. And then I realized that I was getting, um, uh, it was losing contrast because the eye and the skin around it was so dark that I was losing focus. So I moved the focus point just down a little bit and the contrast between the white teeth, the orange ball and the black fur locked the focus um, right on the shot and let me control exactly what was being captured um, as they were running along the beach. Um, it did a fantastic job of let the camera do that, but I'm not letting the camera decide which one of these focus points to use because most cameras, uh, at least in the Nikon line I use, they use something called um, proximity focusing, which means it'll, it'll focus on the thing that's closest to the camera. And sometimes that's not what I want. Um, to be focused on, especially like that shot of the cat in the grass. I wanted to make sure the eye was in focus so it, it was back in the frame. So um, right here, uh, again, the focus, it's a lot easier. If the dog is running sideways, you can focus on any one from the tail to the eye. It's not going to matter. It's in the same plane of focus. Um, I still like to keep the focus point right here. So I want to talk a little bit about lenses. Um, I am a, a focal length matters, and uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of the 70 to 200 2.8 lens. It's probably uh, the lens I take most of my photographs with. It compresses the background. It gives me more working space. Um, one of the other lenses that I use a lot when I was doing the pet photography book is the older 105 millimeter uh, f2.8 um, macro lens. I found that lens let me get close and get detail in some of the animals without actually getting uh, too close to them to either scare them or put Myself or or the animal in any kind of danger. So, this is the uh, this was this was my 70 to 200. Um, it was photographed for a book called Nikon Lenses, which was put out by Peach Pit as well. Um, my buddy Jared uh, Foster wrote the book, um, but I helped him a little bit on some of the Nikon stuff. So this is the lens I had for about uh, six or seven years. I've actually just upgraded to the newer VR2 version of it, but it's it's the same 70 to 200 2.8 lens. And um, one of the things about this lens um, is that when you're holding it, it's important to support it properly. So um, as you can see, when I'm, I've got it, I've actually got the, the tripod shoe um, under my hand, and my elbows are tucked in close so that I have enough stability um, to photograph anything that's moving fast. And I just swivel my body, and I keep the lens nice and straight. So here's some of the things that I did with the 70 to 200. Uh, Obviously, I'm, I do not want to get really close to a galloping horse. Um, I'm not really a horse person. They kind of scare me. They're big. Um, they're strong. And uh, they can have good distance. So I was shooting this through the fence and um, 70 to 200. Some dog agility. You can't get that close to the dogs while they're actually running the agility course. Um, so this was shot straight on while I was lying on the grass at the end of the upright uh, swerve bars or weave um, bars. And the dog was coming right at me. It's again 70 to 200 to 200 millimeters. Uh, one of my favorite cat photographs. This is over at my friend Celeste's house. This cat was really skittish, so I let it calm down and uh, got in close, 200 millimeters. Um, you can start seeing how the background, uh, 200 millimeters, is kind of there's n there's not a whole lot of background or foreground. It really puts the focus right on the animals. The puppies were insanely cute, but this was the first day they were outside in the grass, and mom was kind of protective. So I just lay in one spot and let the puppies kind of play, um, and again, you know, 200 millimeters. Uh, dog beach, uh, one late afternoon. Um, beautiful husky just got out of the water. I didn't know the dog. Um, I'd been sitting, on the, sitting in one spot and just kind of 
framing it the way I wanted to. Again, uh, this was probably taken at about 180 to 100 and 150 to 180 millimeters. You can get in nice and close um, with 200, and you can make the backgrounds kind of compress a little bit. This was shot probably at 100, and, 100 millimeters, 150 millimeters. Um, uh, at a dog walk, we were doing a, one of the cancer raising dog walks in San Diego. Um, this is Maisie. She's a, a friend of mine's boxer. She's deaf, but um, just sitting there and waiting for her to turn, I could frame it nicer without having too many of the other dogs around in the frame. So 105, the 105 millimeter macro is great for photographing things that are small. Um, that's what those macro lenses are made for. So this was done at the We Companions Rescue in San Diego. They had a, a, a bunch of rodents sitting around, and we just kind of let them do their thing and play around. And um, I shot uh, 105 millimeters. I was, so I was still a couple of feet back and not really in the rodent's face as such. Um, 105 million macro worked really well. This is a betta fish in one of those really small, like one foot by two feet tanks. Um, I basically just put a speed line on top of it and waited for the fish to come right into the middle of the screen and uh, snap the sequence of shots. Focus is right on the eye. We were playing out in the park with a bunch of reptiles. Um, this is a cute little turtle. These are a couple of lizards. Uh, they belong to a, a friend of a friend. Um, so we had a lizard feeding day. This was actually on their coffee table. Um, got in really close. Focus was directly on the eyeball at 105 millimeters so that I could get all the details. And the nice thing about that lens is that the stuff back here was maybe a foot away, but because you're shooting um, super, super close, the depth of field is incredibly compressed. So uh, they really pop right out of the frame. They had just finished eating um, some mealworms. Another lizard sitting in the uh, in the park. Um, I was lying on the ground. It kind of reared up. I made sure the focus point was directly on the eye. Um, I'm slightly off here. The focus is somewhere right in here because the focus points are clustered towards the middle of the frame and wasn't this high up. So actually, uh, this shot is a little cropped in um, to give me the composition I wanted and to get the texture and the detail in the scales. Um, sometimes it's nice to add a little you know, person in the, in the photo. Um, but again, I just wanted to make sure that the focus was really, really tight and nothing in the background. This is actually, there's a car back here. Um, there's a street and a tree. And I was just sitting at a lower angle, shooting directly up to try to get the, the snake with the tongue out. Um, and I uh, get some highlights coming in from the sun. So um, a lot of times people just think of focal length as how close you can get to something. You know, 70, you're kind of wide, 200, you're kind of close. But it actually does a whole lot more than that. So these are all the photographs of Hobbes. And in these photographs, I moved so that he would be the same size in each image. But this is Hobbes taken at a 24 millimeters, um, sitting in the backyard. And here's 70 millimeters. And there's 100 millimeters and 200 millimeters. So it took a lot of treats to get him to stay still for that long, uh, for me to change lenses and, and keep readjusting the composition. But after all, we got it. So here you can see the difference in focal lengths. Um, this is probably one of the key things for me is that I, I like to make sure that unless I'm show having to need to show the background in an area where the animal is at for some reason, I would much rather just have the animal be the subject of the matter. And there's a difference between 100 millimeters and 200 millimeters just in how much background or foreground is in the image. Um, as you can see, Hobbes is the relative same size, but his body shape actually changes depending on the focal length. So his ears and his nose look kind of strange in this 24 millimeter shot where the ears are kind of pushed back and his head looks kind of long and stretched out to where it's a much more natural look at 200 millimeters. Um, so a lot of this, this is the same uh, if you're photographing people, the same thing happens to them. Um, uh, actually, it can, be, it can be quite jarring if you do this. So uh, if anyone wants to try it as an experiment, just take a photograph of the same subject at um, a variety of focal lengths and just keep them the same size and use your feet to either move back or forward. I mean, every time I took one of these shots, I had to move back, move back, move back to keep him the same size. 
but um, to me, there's no doubt about 200 millimeter being a better shot than 24. So this is Rex. He was over the house. He was a little um, shy at first. This was taken at 200 millimeters in the backyard. You can see how it really just, it's just all about him. And here's another one of uh, Rex and Hobbs playing. Um, again, shot at uh, 200 millimeters. I was all the way a couple of steps away, giving them their space. Um, but the nice part about it is that while you can see, excuse me, while you can see the, uh, the furniture back here, um, you don't really focus on it. The, the depth of field drops off to the point where your, your attention is right on the two dogs. So uh, that's, you know, the, one of the reasons that I like to shoot at 200 and that's why that 70 to 200 millimeter lens is just one of my favorites. Um, there's a new one out, the well, newish lens out. It's a 70 to 200 f4. Um, it's a great lens as well. You don't quite get that same depth of field at 2.8, but um, it's a, about a thousand dollars cheaper, so it's well worth it um, if that's something you're looking for. So rewards. Uh, I like to treat my dogs well, and it's important that they get rewards when um, we're doing some photos because for them it becomes a job. It becomes something that they can enjoy doing. Um, so I always give the pet the promised treat, and um, I use toys and treats to get them to pose, and I usually play with the animals for a while, then I take a couple of photographs, and we go back to playing some more. So it seems like it's more fun than work. Uh, this, is, this is how we got the neighbor's cat to pose. We just held a little treat right in front of the cat, we moved the hand, 70 to 200, we came in right past the hand and we got the shot. So there's the cat. Posing the cat, getting the shot. Uh, a toy works really well on dogs that are not food driven. Um, That's my friend Christy and her dog, and so we got to play with a tug toy and chew on it for a while and play around in the yard and, and on up on the little furniture. And once the dog calmed down, we managed to get the portrait and then went back to playing for a while. So these were all done using the, that same method. We just basically held the treat and adjusted their aim. Odessa was incredibly food driven, so it was always very easy to get her to focus. Um, in both these shots, uh, my wife is standing just off to the side holding a treat, and the shots, the whole posing the whole time this took was probably a minute. So she got to sit still for 45 seconds and she got a nice big treat. Um, we did it about three or four times, and then we were done for the day. So the whole shoot probably took about three minutes. This is Cortez. Cortez is a hundred and, oh, I want to say probably 40-pound dog. He's, um, he's a lot of fun, but you need, we needed to have something that Cortez wanted to play with to get him uh, kind of interested in what was going on. So Cortez actually likes to play with basketballs. That is a full-size regulation Spalding basketball. Um, Cortez ate it. He's big enough that he can actually grab and puncture a basketball um, and, and eat it. It was uh, truly one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen, but throwing the basketball in the pool and having him go get it and play with it uh, made the whole day and the whole shoot go a lot easier. Again, this was about probably 10 minutes of him getting to play with the basketball in the pool and I got to photograph him waiting for it and going after the ball. So. To them, they don't think of it as a photo shoot, they don't think of it as anything important, they just think of it as having a really good time. And that brings me to patience. Um, I'm not a usually a very patient guy. Photographing pets has taught me patience. Um, I'm, I photograph concerts, they happen, I do three songs, it happens in about 15 minutes, everything is go, 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 go. With, um, when it comes to photographing pets, you got to kind of be patient, because photographing pets can drive you crazy. Um, they don't pose, they don't understand you, they don't know what you're trying to do. So you need to be fun and you need to be able to keep your cool. Um, it's also important to set up what you're going to do before you actually do the shoot. So you can be ready to go when they are and uh, as I said before, I like to keep it short. So um, here's the snake in the grass, um, pun intended, and we were photographing the snake and I, it was there and I was waiting and waiting and waiting. I was looking for a very, very specific shot. So as the snake kept going through the grass, I kept following it until finally I got the tongue coming out. And that's the shot I was looking for. It just so happened that at the same time, um, the snake had moved to a greener background, so I was uh, 
doubly happy that I could actually you know make it pop off the background the way it did. Um, but this took about oh probably five or six minutes of just lying there and waiting for the snake to turn its head in a certain way and wait for the tongue to come out. And the minute it started coming out, I would take a burst of photos, um, see if I got anything, and then just go back to doing it over and over and over again. So uh, once in a while, I do some pet portraits. These were done, we were doing this for the book and for a rescue here in San Diego that deals with um, some animals that are basically at um, their last chance for life. Um, they are animals that need medical attention and a little bit more tender loving care. So we set everything up beforehand and made sure everything was going on and then we just brought the animals in and they sat down and we took the shot. So that's Bam Bam. And that was Diego. Diego just had, uh, I think that's Diego. But anyway, they just had a little surgery and we just put them basically in a spot, got a little bit of their personalities out, took the shot and, and, and went on with our day. But everything was set up before they even came in so that we could just walk them in, take the shot and keep going. Um, this is my neighbor's kitchen counter. So what happened was the cat loves to jump up on the counter when it comes dinner time. So I had my camera set up, I had all the settings done, I had taken a couple of fake shots and I was just waiting. And then I just waited and waited until the cat jumped up and there's the shot. Um, basically, it's just sitting and waiting for the animal to do what they're naturally going to do. You can, you can kind of help them along with some treats and some commands and some motion. But a long time, it's just sitting and waiting to see what they're going to do. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the software stuff that I do with, um, afterwards, uh, the finishing touches. Um, I'm not a huge um, post-processing person. I do a fair amount of Photoshop. I've been using it since it came, oh, since probably version 3, 3, 4, way back when. Not CS3 or 4, but I mean, like, really like Photoshop 3 or 4. Um, but in the long run, I don't like to spend a lot of time sitting on my computer. I'd much rather be out actually photographing stuff. So uh, there's two of the Mac Fun um, software things that, that really kind of speed up some of the things that I want to do. And most of these are just to give the, the shots a little bit of pop, a little bit more um, oomph, as, as, as they say. People can kind of see them. Uh, pop off the screen a little more. So the two that I, I use most often right now are Intensify and Tonality. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this picture of Rex, and this is a new shot. Just He was only here for, for five days until um, he found his forever home, but in that time I photographed him a couple of times sitting out in the backyard. So this is straight out of the camera. Um, no adjustments made, raw file, um, everything is zeroed out. And I bring it into Photoshop and I duplicate um, the background layer because I all the adjustments I make in anything I want to be able to adjust and mask and change the opacity with later so I always do it on a separate layer so the first spot is to copy the background layer and then I open it up in intensify um, now intensify has a whole bunch of presets that it comes with and um, obviously uh, I'm not going to be using architecture or landscape when it comes to photographing or adjusting the um, my pet photography, but I do like their image tune um, right off the bat. So image tune and the fine tune is uh, pro quality. Sorry, um, I, I switch between fine tune and pro quality a lot depending on the image, depending on which one gives me the biggest pop. Now right now this shot worked really well with pro quality. Um, even at 100%, it just gave me an, enough of a pop for me to be like, okay, that's perfect. I just got a little more detail in, in well, in the grass, which I don't really want, but definitely in Rex, which I do want. So now that I have that brought right back in, and that was a one step, hit the preset, hit the OK, bring it in. It's now, um, it's now processed. It's in Photoshop. It's sitting on top of the layer. I now paint out. Um, or mask out the areas that I don't want to have Intensify applied to. And that is not exactly a, a complicated, time-consuming process. It's a big brush. It just takes care of the background um, that I don't want to have any kind of detail added to it. So here is before, and there is after. It's, um, it's subtle. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's not, so there's before. And there's after. And you can definitely see the change in, um, in Rex's face right around the eyes and the fur on his, on, his, on his face. And you can get away with a little bit more uh, 
pop and intensify um, on dogs and cats and, and lizards and rodents and, and things with fur and scales than you can with people because it actually just makes the fur look better. If I would have this so high up um, for like a portrait, it wouldn't do what I wanted it to do. It would make people look a little odd. But on animals, it works great. I've also taken out um, the stuff that's sitting here in the background is still really, really blurry. So um, you can see the difference between the previous one and the post one. There's no changes back here because I maxed it all out. So that's kind of a little pop. If I'm doing something and I just want to add a, a little pop, I go right in there. Um, it's a one step, basically one step process. Um, I'm gonna. This is a. This is a little bit more of a of a bigger pop. So here's the snake um, that we photographed in the park, and this is right out of the camera. This is um, zeroed out in a, a camera raw. It's the raw file that came in. Actually, no adjustments applied, and that's what I'm going to end up with. So this is kind of the before, and here's the after. Um, so that's obviously a lot more um, intensified than uh, than the rec shot. So again, I'm taking it into um, into Intensify Pro, but in this time I actually have some custom um, presets that I've spent a lot of time uh, sitting around and playing with. And what I do is I go into Intensify with a picture, and I will just kind of play around and get something that I like, and then I save it as a as a custom preset for myself. So I have um, a couple of different packs. Uh, one of the packs actually has five presets is available um, from Mac Fun to uh, um, to purchase and download for I think it's four ninety nine. Um, Laurie can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but basically, I, I sat there and I went through and I and I added some pop um, to these animals. So this is one of them, and you can see that um, whatever the adjustments have been made um, over here, you can actually see. You can go into the um, preset and see which ones have been turned on and which ones have been turned off and what has actually what I've actually done. So, but this gives me a great starting point, and I like the pop on it. Um, so I, I spent some time sitting here and adjusting all these little sliders up and down until I liked it. Then I save it. It's it's. Um, then I bring it right back into Photoshop, and again I mask out the gr grass in the background so that I just get the pop on the snake and not on the backgrounds. And it's not exactly like a delicate mask; it's just a big, broad paintbrush to get rid of the the, the grass stuff in the background. Um, I really want Intensify to draw the eye to the animal. I don't want anything that is not the subject to be um, intensified. So uh, the grass and anything that else that's been affected, um, especially stuff that's sitting back here, I will definitely paint out um, so that it uh, still goes back to the original, the original image and intensifies only applied to basically the subject. So, oh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you another way to do the same thing. Um, this is again the snake image done to uh, zeroed out, but instead of opening it up in Intensify, this time I open it up in Tonality. So I'm a huge fan of black and white, but I actually like to use black and white um, to affect my color images. So there's a really nice kind of preset done in the basic presets um, that Mac Fun ships with called Boost Clarity. Um, it's right down there. And you just click on it and it boosts the clarity. Now, it's not a really great black and white image at this point and it was never meant to be a black and white image so I don't really care what I'm looking for is that it's got a boost in contrast and a boost in the clarity exactly the way um, this little preset did. I bring it back into Photoshop and it's looking like a pretty kind of not a really like standout black and white image but now I change the blend mode to lumosity and this is kind of my favorite little black and white to help a color image trick because now it's just looking at the black and white values um, in the image and it's looking at the, at the tonal contrast and I now change the um, lumosity and I can adjust the opacity up and down where I want it. So if I was doing this to a person the opacity would be somewhere down at about 20 or 30 percent because it's a snake and it can use that real punch. I'm keeping it up 97 here but anywhere between 100 and 80 um, percent and so here's the, the, the before shot, and there's the after shot. And this was all done using um, tonality. This is just a black and white layer set in an overlay. 
All right, so that's uh, I'm sitting at a, at 5:45, right on time, and um, I was wondering if there were any anyone had any had any questions um, about what was covered. I also am going to uh, pull up the slide that just shows um, these are the two books um, that deal with pets that are both available on Amazon.com. Um, if you just search for Alan Hess or pet photography, you, you should be able to find them. So. Fantastic. Oh, this is great. Um, there's some images I didn't see before, so this is a treat. <laughs> so. well, I, I did add some new ones that, you know, we had Rex here this week, and between him and Hobbs playing in the yard, it was just such a great opportunity to go out there and photograph, it, of course. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and uh, also, for any of you who want to buy any of the MacFun products, uh, do use his promo code, Alan Hess, uh, to get that 10% off. Okay, uh, we do have a couple questions, so this is your time to ask. Alan, some questions. We're getting more here. Um, so uh, David wanted to know, what do you do to prevent um, the red eyes in pets if you're shooting, you know, let's say, a flash? Uh, um, well, it's a, okay. Or so green. In, in, it's, yeah, green or blue, yeah. um, depending on on, um, on what color the, the rods and cones in the back of their eye are, however a technical point. Um, it's pretty much the same thing as I, as I do with humans. I try to get the flash as far away from the camera as possible. Uh, red eye or blue eye is caused by the light bouncing um, back at the same angle so that it comes uh, because the flash is at the same height as the lens. Um, so red eye reduction doesn't really seem to work that well on them. It's just trying to get them to close their eyes in, in, in the bright flashes. So um, I pretty much uh, try to get the flash off the camera as much as possible when I'm photographing inside. Um, most of the time, I will uh, try to shoot using um, window light or natural light just because it is actually easier with pets. Um, I, the whole book uh, of Pet Portraits That Stand Out talks about um, using off-camera flash. It's a, um, a Nikon shooter, so it's the SB uh, 800s and 910s. Um, and they're either wirelessly controlled from the camera or with a set of pocket wizards. Um, but the idea is to get... Uh, the the flash as far away as you can you can actually see the reflection right here in um, on this cover of Odessa uh, you can actually see that little softbox um, reflected in her eye it was um, it was up and and to my left um, and when she turned her head it it just gave me a little highlight there it didn't do anything it's it's pretty much the same as portrait photography um, you definitely don't want to use the pop up flash that would be the worst light possible so. Um, your, your best bet is to either uh, get the flash off the camera or at least uh, try to bounce it off the ceiling or a wall. Great. Great. So um, the 70 to 200, which, by the way, is my favorite as well. Um, I love that lens. Um, Martin is saying that he feels it's a little bit heavy. Uh, he doesn't like to use a tripod. Uh, how do you get used to it over time is what he's asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it, is, it is really heavy. The older one is... is is probably even heavier. Um, one of the re one of the things uh, that I do is is I is I definitely try to support it by tucking that elbow into my into my side, so that the weight isn't just I'm not just holding it out in front of me. I'm kind of holding it with my body, and um, it keeps it steadier. But uh, I've never used a tripod for pet photography because I find it um, way too cumbersome. They don't tend to pose. Um, I've used a monopod when I've used a, a 400 millimeter lens. Um, that's not a not a standard lens anyone in their right mind would own, um, just for taking pet pictures. I'm lucky enough I've used it, but it's you know it's it's longer. I'll use a monopod for that. So if you find that the 70 to 200 is is really too heavy, and I know some photographers who really don't like it, uh, get a little monopod. Um, that would that would help a lot, and you can get them so that you can actually sit on the ground and be kind of low and still have the um, flexibility and, and be able to move around without having to hold the lens up by yourself. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a couple little monopods, um, well, not little, but I, um, I have one that I think it collapses down to about it's less than a foot. So you can have one that just kind of, you can sit on the ground and still support um, the 70 to 200. Uh, the, newer, the newer 70 to 200 F4 from Nikon, I believe it's a whole lot lighter. Um, I've only shot it once a while ago, and I don't own it. Um, but it also it doesn't come with the tripod collar, so you have to get that separately mm. if you want to use a monopod on it, which was kind of a 
kind of the gist, I thought. But. Yeah, that, that collar's nice to use, so you can just yeah. rotate that camera around. Uh, that's really nice. Yeah, so I mean that's a that's a good alternative if you if you find that the lens is too heavy. I mean I'm I'm a kind of a big guy and I got really used to shooting it in in, um, in concert scenarios where you can't use a monopod or a tripod or anything else. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, it can get it can get tired. Yeah. <laughs> do, Alan, Alan, do you shoot the do you use the seventy to two hundred for your concert photography as well? Is that yeah, true? I did. Seventy two hundred is is probably if you went through all the photographs I've ever taken, you'll you'll see that probably about ninety percent of them were shot. Originally, it was the 80 to 200, and then it was the 80 to 200 VR, or, and then it was the 70 to 200 VR, and now it's the 70 to 200 VR2. Yeah. It's just, I really, really love to shoot at 200 millimeters. I know people who like to shoot at, like, you know, 14, and they like that really wide view in life. Um, I like to shoot really far. I, I am honestly in love with the 400 millimeter lens. Um, if I could figure out a way to afford it, and actually use it on a regular basis. I would buy it at this point. I just uh, borrow it or, or rent it for um, when I really need it. But I, I love that view even more. I mean, I really am kind of a guy who loves that telephoto, um, really, really small, narrow angle of view. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, um, so Anne was asking, uh, most of your shots to seem to be off-centered. Is that preferable? Uh, I... It, it, yeah, it's a. I think that it's a. It's a kind of a. Um, a. It's it's one of those like rules of composition, which um, I'm not always a, a fan of anything that's that's a rule. Uh, I just it seems just more natural to me, especially when it comes to animals that are um, running or playing. I like to give them a little space so they have somewhere to move. Uh, people always talk about the rule of thirds, and you're supposed to place things, you know, off to the center. And I I talk about that in the book, and I talk about composition quite a bit. But I'm, um, I'm going to go back here. Well, I guess I can. Um, but uh, I like to keep um, I like to keep things like off on one third or the other third, and I especially love to make sure that the animal has a place to go. Um, if you look at this cover of of Hobbes, I've even got him over onto the side, but he's looking back into the space. And that just seemed more natural. It seems like you, you don't want to crowd them up against the border. Um, the shot of Odessa uh, was cropped to fit um, a specific cover um, concept. So if it, was, if it was up to me, I would be giving a lot more space off to the side um, over here. Uh, you can see my mouse moving around. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would have more space over here. I like to keep... Um, I like to basically use one third. I also have photographs that the animals are dead center. Um, it just works. Uh, it all depends on on what you what you want to do. Uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Digital Field Guide to Composition, where we, where I went through all the different leading lines and rule of thirds and you know uh, symmetry and all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of times now it just depends on um, on how I feel the photo should look. Um, and with animals, I like to try to give them a little space. Yeah. Um, and also challenging is photographing pets with black fur. So Carrie, <laughs> Carrie wants to know if you have any tips or lighting tips on, let's say, dogs with black fur, cats. Yeah, well, well my favorite um, one, and I, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of an, an odd one. I, I learned this when I was photographing um, a friend's cat who was pure black. Um, the best spot was um, right inside of a doorway that faced out into the yard. Um, for some reason, just the, the fact that the background, the, the light kind of, they're sitting in that deep shadow, um, seemed to have the best kind of even lighting over their fur. And then the problem is that you have to, you have to adjust the exposure on your camera because obviously if you let your camera do it, it's going to try to make it an 18% gray cat or an 18% gray dog. So um, I'm usually down at a stop, maybe a stop and a half underexposing to let that dark fur kind of be dark without losing all the detail in it at all. Um, when it comes to using a flash on that, uh, again, I'm underexposing by probably um, maybe even two stops, and I've got the flash down at you know negative one so that I'm not trying to highlight and make the fur look bright. Um, yeah, but you will actually notice if you sit and stare at a, at a at a black dog for a while, it's not pure black. It'll have different shades in it, and um, the camera doesn't 
kind of know how to deal with that because um, as people should know when you're trying to deal with exposure your camera's trying to make everything to be a nice even 18 percent gray it's mm -hmm. it's going to look at the black fur and it's going to try to overexpose it it's going to look at a white cat and it's going to try to underexpose it so it's up to you then to start doing it i would start by um just dialing in negative one exposure compensation as they sit and uh see how that goes great do you ever use uh, your iphone or smartphone for taking pet photos uh, I do because it's convenient. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of times my phone's in my pocket and my camera's in my office and uh, they're doing something really cute. So I, I do that all the time. Um, I found the key to using your iPhone for it is you kind of have to get in a little closer. And what people still don't seem to understand is that if you tap on the screen, you can actually set the exposure and the focus point on your iPhone. So again, I will try to get the camera um, eye level with the pet and uh, tap on the screen to make the focus and the exposure kind of go right on the on the animal's eyes and then um, with the iPhone I think it's five and newer yeah. you can actually hold the button down and take a sequence of shots right it might be the five S and newer and uh, I'll do that I'll, I'll definitely try to get more than one I'll take four or five in, a, in quick succession um, it seems to work um, better and then I'll just toss out the ones that are either out of focus or didn't work um, and again, a lot of times I try to do it uh, close to where they're outside or in a window light because it's um, you need some more light, especially when they're moving. Um, you want the iPhone to use as high a shutter speed as possible. Right. I wish you had more control over that, but I know, huh? <laughs> I have a little parrot, and I actually photograph her with the iPhone because it's not quite as obtrusive as a big lens in her face. So I get away with right. a few more things because it's smaller. Um, a couple comments here. I thought this was really entertaining. Um, Alan, uh, another Alan, said, what a great, great webinar. I've learned so much. Watching here with a sleeping cat in my lap. Well, it's nearly 2 a.m. here, so. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Thank you for staying up. That's, uh, um, actually, one of the hardest things that is to, is I work at home and I have my home office and, and Hobbs likes to um, come. He hasn't done it tonight. I'm actually shocked. I thought at some point we'd get an interruption, but he likes to come and bark at me at about every hour. So it keeps me on track. Like, okay, it's time to get up and stretch. You've been sitting for an hour. So even my writing schedule now is about an hour of writing, 10 minutes of playing with a dog, going back to an hour of writing. Um, but they're just around me all the time. It's, it's inspiration. It, it, was a, it, it was very tough when Odessa passed away in November. Um, but, you know, uh, we still got hobs and we're fostering animals and we'll always have, um, you know, dogs or cats here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Diane said, uh, you have some beautiful babies, and one can tell they are loved, so for sure, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, did Veronica, she said, um, I dare Alan to shoot my cats, or to photograph <laughs> her cats. Good luck. <laughs> she has some shy cats. So um, with, with cats like that, I mean, just kind of egging them on with treats or just kind of sitting with, with them for a while, is that well, the, the key? Yeah, so what I usually do when I go over and, and I photograph uh when when we when we did the pet photography book, um, my we my publisher you know did not want an entire book of uh, my two dogs. That was it, it's a pet photography book, not Alan's dogs book. So I actually contacted all my friends and family and neighbors, and you know we photographed um, at, at rescues and in people's houses and people I'd never met before, and dogs and cats I'd never met before, and horses and snakes. And, um, I didn't know a lot of these animals, so um, I would walk into someone's house and I would sit on the floor. I wouldn't even take out my camera, and I would sit and talk to the people for about an hour. We would chat about anything, you know, um, before even bringing a camera out. And I would just sit in one spot, and um, if the animal liked treats, then I would just have some treats next to me, and I wouldn't try to feed them, I wouldn't try to do anything with them. And um, dogs especially will will start just accepting you if you ignore them. They want, they see that as a sign of, of you being in control of the world, and they will actually just kind of relax around you because um, you're you're like, all right, you got a handle on it. They don't need to deal with you. Um, cats are a little bit tougher. They can be really stubborn and, and they can ignore you for hours. Usually at, at that point, I would try to get the owner to uh, entice them out with their favorite treat or their favorite toy. And again, I would know exactly like what part of the room I was going to be photographing in. I would have um, I would have set up my camera beforehand. I would have taken some test shots to make sure that my exposure was correct. I would make sure everything was ready to go. 
um, and I would try to move as little as possible and use that longer lens. So I would just kind of be lying on their living room floor for half an hour while they played with a cat over on the other side of the, the house. And then as the cat came closer and where we needed to get the photograph, I would just start taking pictures. Um, and it worked surprisingly well. There was only one, uh, I was over at a friend's house, she had about, oh, I think she has six cats. And five of them came out and played, and one of them just wanted nothing to do with me at all. And um, I was there for about three hours, and we never got a picture of that sixth cat. I'm not saying they wouldn't go back and try it again. It's, it's, it's one of those things that you just you can't get frustrated. You have to be patient. Um, but one of the keys is I don't walk into the house all loud with my cameras and slam everything down and start immediately trying to get pictures of the animals. I, I, it's a very slow, slow process um, right at the beginning. And it lets the animals get to know me, and it lets me kind of get to see how they're moving around and how um, relaxed they are. I never, ever want to put an animal in a position where it's scared or frightened or thinks that whatever's happening is bad. It's always going to be positive. They're always going to get to play with a toy or get a treat or something out of it. So, um, and if it's your cat, you know where they like to hang out. I know exactly where my dogs are. I could take a picture of Hodge every single day. I know where he's going to be at noon because he loves to sit on the red carpet by the back door in the sunlight. That's his favorite spot. And I know that I could, I could get him there every single day. So if you have your pet and you want to photograph him, just pay attention to them for like two or three days, figure out where their favorite spot is, and set your camera up close to it. And when they're in their favorite spot, snap away. That's great. Well, Alan, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic webinar. And folks, I have his book, Pet Photography. It's really great, very easy to follow, great you know, illustrations and you know the... The photographs are fantastic. So, Alan, thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today as well. So I really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. All right, everyone. Have a good evening. All right. Bye-bye.